welcome to this lecture on uh, micro architecture security uh, especially we will be talking about uh, two micro architecture attacks called uh, spectre and meltdown so so far in this course uh, we, we started with the notion of uh, isa uh, registers and then what programmers can uh, see and what programmers can do and then we talk about the interface after which uh, the programmers can't access these structures directly but uh, these are there in the processor uh, or in the memory hierarchy to improve our application performance, right? But uh, as we have already discussed, it's not exposed to programmers. So you can't uh, uh, have instruction that says, okay, go to cache line number X or branch predictor entry number 10, right? However, uh, this lecture will talk about how you can program uh, exploiting all this uh, micro architectural uh, features that have been uh, proposed to improve performance and the, the, all the structures or micro architectural ideas how they can become source of uh, information leakage uh, so that will be the focus of this lecture so a uh, bit of uh, security before we move on to information leakage so Typically, when we talk about something is secure, uh, a pretty uh, one on one level, uh, uh, 10,000 feet view uh, of security is you should satisfy this following property, what is called the confidentiality, integrity, and uh, availability. So, confidentiality deals with you don't see what you are not supposed to see. So, in the context of microarchitecture, you can't load what you are not supposed to load that means if your uh, address space doesn't permit you to see that address you can't load it similarly obviously if you can't load it you should not store anything or overwrite anything right and finally it, it's all uh, about uh, shared resources or resources that are shared by multiple threads or multiple cores uh, you should not uh, intentionally or unintentionally you should not affect others by by occupying or hogging the resources because of which other programs uh, may suffer in terms of uh, uh, performance with that uh, let us look into uh, some of the recent uh, attacks that that came up in last three four years so previously uh, we we were uh, kind of used to uh, getting this uh, commercial like Intel inside. But from last few years, it has been uh, the case that there are so many micro architectural attacks inside. Uh, you will find uh, plenty of uh, news articles, blogs and uh, whatnot about uh, micro architecture security. Just, just go and Google uh, hardware attacks or micro architecture attacks and you will get uh, plenty of uh, articles to read. So let's look at uh, at a high level uh, how something can get leaked uh, through microarchitecture and the simple microarchitecture is cas so we'll uh, look at how you can uh, get the data of, of some other core or other process even uh, if you are not uh, allowed to access those uh, uh, data or, or uh, the cas lines that belong to other processor core so this is a simple uh, for loop if you look at uh, here this part of the code and so you can assume this is part of some crypto library that is used by multiple processes running on a multi-core system and uh, what it is doing is it's trying to compute uh, the following uh, thing and the attacker is actually interested in finding out this particular exponent okay and what is interesting that is happening if you look at this uh, control flow here so if a particular exponent bit is zero remember this is a sequence of zeros and ones okay if a particular index uh, in that exponent is zero then we are just doing square followed by reduce so reduce is nothing but the modulo operation but if a particular bit is one we are also doing multiply and uh, reduce so this is actually multiply and then followed by reduce okay so now uh, if you correlate with uh, all these accesses into cast lines so they are actually mapped to some cast lines in the cast hierarchy right 
So now, depending on uh, which of these lines are accessed, you will be able to know whether uh, a particular exponent bit is zero or one. Obviously, it's hard. It, it's not that easy the way I am uh, explaining here, but that's the high level view. So what the attacker does is it exploits timing channel. So it's a channel through which you can infer the timing difference or the latency difference. So let's let's assume that the attacker has the access to uh, uh, that particular crypto library that is shared by other processes also. But the attacker is interested to find out whether the other processes has access to this crypto library. Okay. So it, it's not that whether uh, anyone uh, running something remotely and then and, and you are trying to access their data. Let's make it pretty simple that it's a shared library, but uh, you are not supposed to see what other processes are doing, even if uh, both of you are actually uh, using a shared crypto library, right? So what the attacker can do is it can actually keep on sending requests to all these addresses, right? And try to find out the latency. So a simple latency difference will be uh, LLC hit versus uh, LLC miss, right? And based on that, the attacker can infer whether the victim has actually accessed them. If it has access, it will be there in the cache. You will get a hit in the LLC, right? And then what you can do is you can actually try to correlate with the patterns that I have talked about, whether it's a just uh, square and reduce or it's square reduce followed by multiply reduce so these are actually the latency for all these addresses whether the latency is 100 cycles or more than that and based on that finally you will get a sequence of let's say 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, right so eventually you'll be able to get the exponent so that that's the high level view there are so many subtle issues but uh, for this lecture let's assume that this is how the attacker will uh, be able to leak data so a simple example of a cache attack is known as plus and reload attack, uh, in short F plus R. So where uh, what attacker does is, so here the assumption is victim and attacker, they are sharing some portion of memory. It's a shared memory attack. And, uh, but the attacker wants to know whether victim has access something, okay? So what attacker does, it flushes a particular address uh when i say flush it means it won't be there in the processor it will be flushed out from the cache hierarchy into the memory and then it starts a timer and try to access the same address it's just uh simple load operations you can do and anytime if you uh, get a fast access for one of these iterations that means uh, the victim has actually brought the address a into the processor or the cache right based on that you will be able to infer that your yeah, victim victim has actually accessed that particular cache line or cache line address or even the set number right so uh, again high level view on cache attacks so there are various cache attacks that exploit these timing channels mostly the last level uh, cache hit and miss because the difference is uh, quite uh, if you compare with the private caches uh, hit and miss difference, the last level cache uh, hit and miss is easy to uh, differentiate. So we, we just talked about the flush zero attack, uh, but there are other uh, attacks which are actually known as eviction based attack, where you don't share anything with the attacker, uh, sorry, victim. But uh, what you can do is since you share the last level cache and DRAM, you kind of evict everything that victim has brought into the cache, you kind of thrust the entire cache and try to see whether victim has brought anything in the future and uh, exploit the timing channels, okay? So uh, the threat model can be pretty simple. Uh, if the victim knows or the uh, attacker knows that victim has access to one of the cache set, that itself is a successful attack because once you know that, okay, there is some activity happening on a particular cache set, then you can do post-mortem analysis and then try to find out what are the possible addresses that the victim has accessed, right? Because we are dealing with eight-way or 16-way assertive cache. So with that, uh, I'll jump to two interesting attacks called Spectre and Meltdown. They actually use cache as a source of timing channel, 
but uh, the key to these two attacks are actually uh, through speculative execution and uh, out of border execution so let's start with the specter first so uh, this is the attack scenario uh, this is an array which is uh, let's call it victims array this uh, attacker can't access it directly it's not mapped to its address space uh, but attacker is controlling uh, this particular if condition by sending a parameter so uh, you can assume there is a source code in a large software where a process provides a parameter and that parameter is used by uh, some other process uh, and then uh, depending on the functionality uh, what attacker can do is it can actually pass something which it's not supposed to pass right for example the legitimate values uh, for uh, the size of this particular array is uh, uh, less than three right whether the array size is zero one or two or three right uh, one two or three not zero one two three but what attacker can do is it can actually send the value four right and in reality this condition should have been false because the size of this array is three and four is less than three right so you should not be allowed to access this particular uh, part of the code but what can happen is the attacker can trust the entire cache which means there is nothing in the cache so even finding out the size of this array will go to dram that will take let's say 200 cycles and uh, so that, that's what's happening here uh, you are actually going to uh, dram uh, for for accessing that particular array right and in the meantime can the attacker do anything through which it can uh, leak data right so my array is actually the attacker's array and uh, the cs305 array is the victim's array okay so uh, let's let's uh, look into uh, the branch predictor and speculative execution what exactly happens so i as i talked about this particular condition will be false but the branch predictor returns true which is surprising and why it happens it happens because the attacker has mistrained the branch predictor by sending legitimate values in the past so attacker must have sent one two three one two three and all so which means the branch predictor has trained that okay for this particular pc the branch will be taken in the future right so now the code flow has entered into uh, this this particular uh, path so we have already entered into uh, uh, a sequence of instruction or one instruction that we are not supposed to enter into so th this is just to show that we are still in the speculative execution okay the processor is still assuming that everything is good and but actually processor is in the wrong path the attacker has actually fooled the branch predictor and we will see what can happen next so uh, as you can uh, know that in the uh, out of border uh, processor with um, uh, tens of pipeline stages uh, Resolving a branch can take hundreds of cycles and 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 uh, here as we are depending on a load so once we get a Response from the DRAM because the attacker has already thrust the entire cache Then only you will be able to verify whether this condition is true or false. So let's assume this particular statement will take around 200 cycles And finally now what can attacker do? Yes, so attacker can actually play a game with the caches how let's say finally the processor realized it was a mistake uh, the branch predictor actually uh, made a wrong prediction and it flushed all the wrong path instruction from the rob right however the cache has already the data remember cache is the micro architecture as a programmer you can't do anything even the processor doesn't care about clearing it you brought something into the cache uh, during the wrong path but it's not a big deal okay and finally what attacker does it actually plays around with uh, different values for this particular uh, variable to find out what exactly was the data that was stored in this address right remember this was victims victims uh, data structure or victims uh, address right so now what uh, the attacker do is the attacker will send okay load my array in this zero 
let's say it's get 60 nanoseconds that means it's coming from the DRAM let's say you try uh, 5112 again it takes 60 nanoseconds that means it's also coming from DRAM let's say suddenly you tried 1024 that means uh, this value is 2 and you are accessing my array of 1024 and it took only 5 nanoseconds that means it's there on the cache and since you have thrust the entire cache you haven't brought anything so which means this is actually brought during the speculative execution and if we correlate back this 1024 with this particular uh, index value it reveals that this particular address stores value 2 right so it's it's kind of scary that we are able to get the data of another process even if we don't have access permission to get that uh, data so similarly there is another attack called meltdown which is uh, exploiting the out of order it's pretty simple you will understand it uh, in a minute so let's say that this is a simple uh, code snippet where you raise an exception and as, as you know once you raise an exception the processor is supposed to uh, stop everything make sure the processor is entering inside the precise state and let's say after that statement there is some access to kernel memory right let's say the entire kernel space is uh, mapped to something right a large data structure or just a specific address that is mapped to a particular variable okay now with out of order uh, what will happen is this sequence of operations can become completely messed up because the out of order processor will see that these two instructions are actually there, there is no dependency so what it does just to exploit instruction level parallelism and to improve throughput it actually accesses this particular data structure and eventually it should be inside this variable right so now again by the time you realize that you are not supposed to access it because you have raised an exception that means you should not do anything after this exception till you have handled the exception but because of the out of order execution you have actually uh, gone ahead and you have uh, sent a request to the DRAM uh, or memory hierarchy saying okay i need the data which is stored in this particular address right then by the time you reach the head of the rob remember the rob will actually uh, make sure that everything is happening in order and that time you will realize that oh this is a mistake and then you will start flushing the rob right but again the data is already there in the cache because by the time you have raised this exception and by the time it reaches the head of the rob there will be hundreds of cycles so in the meantime the attacker can just write a simple for loop that we did uh, in spectre attack and try to get the data which is present in this address okay so the, that's what is the meltdown attack uh, you can obviously get confused with like why not a page fault because you are not supposed to access it but yeah the page fault will actually come when you reach the head of the rop right till that time everything is uh, happening as as if not, not, like nothing has changed everything is proper uh, from the processor point of view so if you want to know more about these attacks uh, there will be a course uh, coming next semester um, which will be talking about both the performance and security aspects of uh, modern processors so uh, go and check out if you are interested with that i will stop thank you